Hello and welcome to episode 181 of the Thinking LSAT podcast in snowy Vienna, Virginia. This is Ben Olson. With me is Nathan Fox. What's going on, man? Dude, uh, life is good. I can say that. Yeah. Um, What's good about it? Well, I started a new uh, workout and it's a lot more intense than what I was doing even just like two weeks ago. And so I'm more tired, but at the same time, I fall asleep like a baby <laughs> without all my melatonin. <laughs> the candy dish doesn't need to be refilled yeah. anymore. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I'm just out. It's weird. I haven't slept like that in a while. Huh. So I've been sleeping good, too, mostly because of my crazy travel schedule. I was in Bandon, Oregon over the weekend playing golf with 23 of my closest friends getting rained on and sideways sleeted on uh and drinking too much Wait, while you're golfing oh hell yeah man we go in the off season <laughs> to bandon okay because bandon is like this unbelievable like super spectacular place it's impossible mm-hmm, to get to mm-hmm. like we fly to portland and drive four hours out to the coast um wow. it's in the middle of nowhere and but it's it's super beautiful and it's uh like 40 percent of the normal cost when you go in the winter time Uh, And that's because there's like about an 80% chance that you're going to get some pretty nasty weather at some point during your trip. Mm. So like, yeah, the first day it was just like a monsoon. And then the second day it was sideways stinging like sleet for a few of the hours. But we're out there all day, like all day, every day, as long as there's sun out, we're out there doing it. Uh, We play a bunch of matches and stuff, but it's really, it's just fun. I do it every year. It's awesome. That's cool. It's an adventure. I look forward to it. Get all my gear and everything ready to go. And now it's all back in my closet <laughs> for another year until I go back out there next year. Yeah. So that's good times. Nice. Today on the show, we're going to do another LSAT fundamental. It's going to be on conditional reasoning. Uh, that's if then statements. Today is Wednesday, February 20th. I know that if you're listening to this, it's probably, you no, know, it is <laughs> after that, but we are going to do Facebook live today. And if possible, try to incorporate that into the show. If it's a disaster and we're not able to do that technologically, we won't, but um, that might be at the end of this show. If you have questions, you can always email us at help at thinkinglsat.com. Send us your selfies and we'll include them in the uh, show notes uh, and posts on Facebook and Instagram and so forth. There's a lot of different ways to listen to the show. You can listen on Spotify, uh, in Apple podcasts on YouTube. Uh, for those of you who like to do that, someone just commented actually this morning that they prefer YouTube because it's easy to listen to us twice as fast. (laughs) Um, I think you can do that in a lot of other apps as well, but YouTube is one place in which you can do that. You can also find us on Stitcher, and, of course, at thinkinglsat.com. I wonder if anybody sure ever listens on half speed just to make sure everything is sinking in. I think I'd have to put pencils in my hand <laughs> to listen to half speed. Yeah. You're like, what, <laughs> what? I, I actually listen to audiobooks at one and a half speed. Sometimes I'll listen to double speed depending on the reader. Mm-hmm. And then when I slow it down to normal speed, sometimes it's just like, whoa. All right, get to your point. Excruciatingly get to your point. slow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I know people have said that we're slow <laughs> in the past. Maybe that's just that's how we roll. Please leave a review on iTunes. That helps a ton. That helps others find the show. If you love us or hate us, we'd love to hear from you. So awesome. Yeah. Hey, just <clears throat> yesterday we did another demon development sprint with the developers. And uh, we're continuing that. We were continuing that this morning, which is why I wasn't able to join you earlier. But we got a lot of exciting stuff going on. We just released several new features. One is people now have the ability to flag questions to review later. So as you're doing a question, if you're like, hey, I don't want to come back to this question, you can flag it. And then that flag will be in your study history so you can see what that question is and come back to it if you want to. That's especially great if you're like working with one of us doing tutoring. Mm -hmm. Um, You could flag questions that you want to review with your tutor and then you could do that from inside the demon, I imagine. Yeah, exactly. So you would just go to your study history, you'd see which questions you had flagged 
And from your study history, you can either choose to redo the question without seeing the answer that you chose earlier, or you can jump right to the explanation. And so, yeah, that would be a great opportunity to redo the question and be like, what do you think now? <laughs> and what's your thought process? Awesome. Yeah. We also gave people the ability to delete questions from their study history. So sometimes people do a question and they maybe <laughs> submit an answer that they didn't intend to submit and so forth. So some people have been asking for the option to clean up some of those mistakes from their study uh, history. Like I didn't actually do that one or I got interrupted or something like that. Exactly. Cool. Yeah. So that's now a feature. Seems um, useful. Yep. Yep. Uh, the timed games and reading comp sections are now available. There are still some known issues, but if you do the section from start to finish, uh, you shouldn't encounter any of those. <laughs> and so we decided to go ahead and release it so that people could start doing that. It will be fine for the vast majority of users. And uh, Max, who's been helping us, has actually gotten on the phone with, I don't know, 50 some odd what he calls power users, and he's trying to reach like 100 or something, 150 of them. But in any case, they were excited to see these time sections uh, go live, so we decided to just go ahead and release it, despite the fact that we still want to make some changes. But I think they're going to be more beneficial to have available than not. Cool. Yeah. Um, finally, uh, Max created a Slack group for subscribers of the Demon, and so if you're a subscriber, you should have gotten an email from Max uh, inviting you to join that group. Just uh, I would encourage you to do so and go ahead and join the conversation there. It's, it's, a, it's a private group for anyone who's a subscriber, and um, it's kind of like the Facebook group, I guess, but it's for the demon. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Finally, sorry, one more thing about LSATdemon.com. This is from Becky. She wrote in uh, late one night. She had a technical issue and I was sitting at my computer and the email came in and I responded and she goes, hello, am I actually responding to Ben Olson? <laughs> it's okay if not, but this is almost an almost surreal IT request experience if so. And she said, yes, I'm able to log in now. Thanks, blah, blah, blah. But then she wrote back and this is what I wanted to read on the show. She said, I wanted to take this opportunity to thank you. I appreciate the demon and consider it a method of supporting your and Nathan's influence in the LSAT prep field. Seems like it needs a shakeup. Uh, that's definitely true. Um, more importantly for myself, I think that without advice from the thinking LSAT, I would likely have had applied to law school with a 158 and no legal experience. Instead, I'm working in a law office, taking time to work on my score and more deeply consider this decision. I know we've said this a million times, but it's refreshing to hear that people are actually taking that advice seriously and taking time to go to law school. Um, maybe you shouldn't go, and taking that time can help you make the decision not to go. And at the very least, if you decide to go, after all, hopefully Becky will end up going with a higher score, which is just worth money period yeah it's super rewarding when our students actually take our advice students and listeners and readers when they actually take our advice it's like the best thing and and the outcomes end up being just vastly better when they do so uh yeah thanks becky for the update i mean she ends up going to law school with a 10 points higher lsat and some actual legal experience so she knows what she's getting herself into or if she decides not to go to law school at all I mean, this is all just going to be a huge win for her to just pump the brakes a little bit. Amazing. Yeah. One thing I did want to say is she, she says she considers doing the demon as a method of supporting our influence in the LSAT prep field. And I wanted to say that it's totally true. I mean, we haven't made a profit yet on the demon. We're just taking all <laughs> the money that we're getting from those people who are signing up and putting it right back into development. So... If you're one of those people, as Max calls them, power users, and you want to push the ball forward, signing up definitely helps us do that. I mean, we've been pleasantly surprised by how quickly the user base is growing, and it continues to grow, and it's exciting. But uh, at the same time, we just turn around and put all that money back into the demon. So Yeah, I mean, and the feedback, too, is just overwhelmingly positive. Like, all that work that Max has done interviewing users, he's saying that, like, yeah, there's there's feature requests, and 
and uh, and stuff but mostly people are just like oh my god i can't believe how great it is so that's yeah awesome great to hear yeah and yeah it would be nice ben eventually we'll start getting paid out of it yeah but right now it just it's exciting to keep it growing and fixing all the issues that people are encountering and trying to make it better and better yep Cool. Cool. So should we jump into this uh, LSAT fundamental? Uh, first, we got to get through some upcoming events. If you're hearing this podcast on launch date, February 25th, I will be at Santa Clara University tonight at 7, 10 p.m. I am also going to be in Berkeley on March 11th at 7 p.m. And we have a live class coming up in Las Vegas, March 16th and 17th. Still a couple more weeks to register for that. That's all day instruction from me and Ben. And sounds like we might have special guest Rachel Gezersay coming yeah. to talk mm-hmm. about uh, how to hustle your ass into a legal job. Yeah. Uh, which is important. And just to put it on your radar, April 23rd, I will be in Seattle uh, at Seattle University around noon on April 23rd. We'll give you more information about uh the March and April events as they get a little bit closer, but you can also go to thinking else at um, our site or our Instagram or Facebook or anywhere and uh, click the RSVP links for any of those events. And please do um, help to spread the word. If you happen to be in uh, Berkeley or Vegas or Seattle and want to uh, help us to out outreach to, um, you know, other people that might be studying for the LSAT. Yeah. Cool. It's exciting. You're going all over the place. Yeah, man. Well, I, you know, I, uh, I love traveling. It's easy for me to travel. I can work from anywhere. So, you know, I got to show up for my class in LA and my class in San Francisco, but beyond those two things, it's pretty easy for me to hop on a Southwest flight, especially if I'm just on the, on the West coast Mm. and I enjoy doing it and it's nice to go out and say hi to the folks. So yeah, go team. Go team. All right. Conditional reasoning. Yeah. Yeah. What would, what would you say is the most important thing to take away from conditional reasoning? If you're going to just get one thing out of my uh, out of our conditional reasoning lessons, you have to understand the sufficient versus necessary flaw. That's what I really want people to understand. I want people to understand the very common broken reasoning called confusing sufficient for necessary it's common sense it really is like a smart 10 year old understands the sufficient necessary flaw they don't know the words for it you know but a smart 10 year old would know that you know it is true that if you're in LA you have to be in California but that does not mean that if you are in California, you have to be in L.A. Mm-hmm. Probably your kids, Ben. Do you think your kids would understand that? I hope. You know, All the way down to you even don't the know youngest until one? Intestine. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would hope so. Although sometimes kids surprise me with what they do understand and what they don't understand. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I guess I'll have to report back on that one. So I... By the way, just to back up a little bit, if if people are hearing this without any context, what we're doing here is with 10 years of experience teaching LSAT, we're kind of going back and rebooting our way of thinking about and talking about teaching the LSAT. So we've done previous fundamentals on how to study for the LSAT, each of the different section types, um, a little bit on last one was on logical reasoning question types, and now we're getting into the LSAT's most important flaw and just some, some ideas about conditional reasoning. My thinking about how to teach conditional reasoning has changed dramatically since I was, you know, in the LSAT dogma days 10 years ago. Sure. Um, so that's what I would want people to get out of it is just, I want you to understand the sufficient and necessary flaw so deeply that you can with five seconds notice, create a brand new version, your own version of the flaw. Mm -hmm. If I say, give me an example of the sufficient necessary flaw, you should spit back at me immediately an example of the flaw that you came up with off the top of your head. Yeah. Then that's when I really believe you that you actually understand the flaw. Mm -hmm. How about you? Uh, I want you to be able to come up with your own example and on a, a gut level, really understand the meaning of the terms sufficient and necessary. Cause not only will it help you with this flaw, but 
just so many different parts of the test which <laughs> test this even outside of you know a traditional logical reasoning flaw question. Okay, great. We need to give people definitions of a few words. Sure. And it's funny because it's like, I tend to do this on the very first day of class or maybe sometimes on the second day of class, Mm -hmm. but people have to, you just let, we're going to teach you what the words sufficient and necessary mean, Mm -hmm. but we're not going to annoyingly define the word sufficient using the word necessary in the definition (laughs) and then turn around and define the word necessary using the word sufficient in the definition. Mm Mm-hmm. Because when you do that, you have to understand one of the terms to understand the other term. And so it just becomes like circular nonsense. And that's how people can take like an entire Kaplan class and come away from it and still not know what sufficient necessary are. I also don't feel like those classes necessarily focus on those terms as much. I think they tend to focus more on if and then and so forth. Well, then maybe power score or test masters or blueprint or whatever it is. But like I, I just get refugees from all of these big classes all the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, are you serious? You took a like $2,000 three month LSAT class and you can't describe to me what sufficient and necessary mean. Yeah. So (laughs) let's, let's do it. How how do you like to, what do you do when you teach those definitions? Cause I have a, I have a way of doing it. First of all, I like to give real world examples Okay. So for, for example, <laughs> uh, I tend to st- talk about necessary first and I say things like, look, what is something that you absolutely need to survive? And the most common answer is water. And I say, yeah, that's necessary because if you don't have it, you'll die. It's also a convenient time to talk about sufficient. It's not a sufficient thing because even if you have water, that doesn't necessarily mean that you'll survive. So water is a good example of something that's necessary but not sufficient for survival. And just because it's necessary doesn't mean that it's the only thing that you need. You might need a lot of other things like food, companionship, and so on. And when I'm giving that example, I'm trying to illustrate this idea that Something that's necessary is absolutely required. It's essential. Without it, you can't survive. But it doesn't mean that if you have it, you're good to go because you might need other things as well. There could be multiple necessary conditions or necessary things. And that's one thing that the LSAT likes to test over and over again. Okay. Yeah. So that's my example for necessary. Do you want to add to that or what do you usually do, I guess? So I like to talk about if then statements, right? And if then statement is the just easiest basic example of a conditional statement, right? A condition Mm -hmm. is just an if then conditional Mm -hmm. statement is an if then. Mm -hmm. So I will say something like the geography one is always a real easy thing to imagine, right? Mm -hmm. If you're in Salt Lake city, you are in Utah. And then when I break that down, I mean, so I, so I always start with the flaw though, because I just, I want people to get so tuned into the flaw. Mm-hmm. If you're in Salt Lake city, you're in Utah. Jim's in Utah. Therefore Jim is in Salt Lake city. And if you're being critical or skeptical at all, you have to realize that there are other places in Utah besides Salt Lake city. Another way of saying this is that if you are in Salt Lake city, it is necessary that you be in Utah. Mm -hmm. But being in Utah does not make it necessary for you to be in Salt Lake City. Yep. Right? Yeah. Okay. So then I tend to write the words sufficient and necessary on the board up above the Salt Lake City, Utah, right? Mm -hmm. Sufficient on the left, necessary on the right, always. And then I give definitions of sufficient and necessary, and I hope that it actually helps people understand what these words mean. I like the way you're starting with necessary because I think everybody does understand what necessary means. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a more commonly used uh, term than sufficient. Yeah. But what sufficient is on the LSAT is sufficient means enough. Enough what? Well, enough information to prove Sufficient means 
enough information to prove. So if Jim is in Salt Lake City, we now have sufficient information about Jim to prove that Jim is necessarily in Utah. Mm -hmm. And I, I tend to go around with it a few times, right? Like I, I like to use the word sufficient without saying necessary. And I like to use the word necessary without saying sufficient. But then I want to make it clear that if you have a sufficient condition, you do have a necessary condition. There's mm -hmm. no such thing as a sufficient condition without a necessary condition, right? Yeah. So the sufficient's on the left. That's the if. The necessary is on the right. That's the then. But these words make sense. They're not just arbitrarily made up bullshit. Mm -hmm. Sufficient means enough information to prove one other thing. That other thing is what we call the necessary. This has to be necessarily true. Yeah. Okay. Where do we go from there? Well, I like to uh, hammer home that idea that sufficient means enough, especially in the context of an example that's not intuitive. So in your example, you're saying that if you're in Salt Lake City, then you know necessarily that you're in Utah. So being in Salt Lake City is sufficient or enough information to now know that that person or whoever we're talking about is in Utah. And so people are like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. That's, that's what I expect based on my real world experience. And then I like to give people something that they're not <laughs> as familiar with. So for example, if I go to the grocery store, then I am going to cry, right? That is not actually true, but if the LSAT were to say that to you, if they were to give you an if-then statement and tell you to assume that, that it's true, then you just have to accept that that's true, that if I go to the grocery store, then I'm going to cry. What is the sufficient condition? The sufficient condition is the if clause. It's if I go to the grocery store, which means that that condition is enough. It's enough information to know that I'm going to cry. So if I call you up, Nathan, and I say, hey, I'm going to this grocery store. I'm actually at the grocery store right now. I could hang up and you wouldn't need any more information. That information alone would be enough to know that I'm going to cry because the if then statement said, if I go to the grocery store, then I'm going to cry. And I'm just really trying to hammer home that idea that it's that's why the if clause is called the sufficient condition because it's enough. You don't need any more information. And then crying is the necessary condition for going to the store because it necessarily has to happen if I do go to the store. Yeah, it must be true. Mm -hmm. It's necessary. If you're at the grocery store, according to that rule, then you must cry. It is mm -hmm. necessary that you cry. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And then I, I think it's it's interesting because a lot of people, you know, we use if then statements in our life all the time. And uh, for whatever reason, when I say to people, if I go to the grocery store, then I'm going to cry. People will say things to me like, oh, so you're, you're saying that you need to go to the grocery store to cry, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's like, well, no, we we know that going to the grocery store is going to guarantee that I cry. But this statement is not saying that I need to go to the grocery store uh, to cry. It's just saying, if I do, then I will. And I think it's people say, well, I don't, they're not telling me anything else. So I don't know anything else. Or I don't know other things that would make you cry. And it's like, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's very possible that nothing else would would lead to my crying. But uh, we don't know that. And just think about it for a second here. Like if you punched me in the stomach, uh, <laughs> maybe I'd start crying. I hope I'm tougher than that. But maybe that would lead to me crying as well. So we don't need me to go to the store to know that I'm going to cry. Maybe... Um, something else would lead to me crying as well. Yeah, the necessary is the need to. Mm -hmm. So the crying is the need to. And yeah. that the and it only applies when you go to the grocery store. But when you go to the grocery store, we know for sure that you're crying. Yeah. 
you also might be crying all other times, potentially, according to that rule. Even mm-hmm. when you don't go to the grocery store, you might also cry. Yeah. All we know for sure is if you go to the grocery store, you are goddamn going to cry for sure. Yeah. That's it. One thing I like to do is I like to test people too. I'll say, okay, so um, let's say that I'm crying. What do you know? And most people will say, oh, we don't know anything. We don't know if you're at the store or if you're crying for some other reason because you just got punched in the stomach. But some people will definitely raise their hands. They're like, oh, oh, um, you must be at the grocery store. And it's like, ah, right. Okay. So right gotcha. there, you're, yep, you're switching sufficient and necessary, which is exactly what the LSAT is trying to test. Yeah, that's how I do it too. I teach, I, I will I will give the what we can call the mistaken reversal and the mistaken negation. I don't really think it's that important that people memorize those terms. You know, those are terms that are never on the LSAT and maybe one out of 500 questions actually test the difference between those two annoyingly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I, but I do, I do just make sure that people can catch both versions of the sufficient necessary flaw. So both. And by the way, when you make the sufficient necessary flaw, what you're essentially doing is fucking up the contrapositive, right? Mm hmm. The contrapositive is a very easy two-step process. The contrapositive is basically just common sense. Yeah. You're going to flip the terms and you're going to negate the terms. So if I go to the grocery store, I have to cry becomes if I don't cry, I didn't go to the grocery store. Yeah. I mean, Um, try to think about it intuitively here. If I'm not crying, then there's no way that I could have gone to the grocery store. Or because be the, the rule store. was, if I go to the grocery store, I must cry. It's yeah. totally common sense. I like to do it in a less abstract, you know, this is an art, like really arbitrary and nonsensical rule that we're using now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that makes it a little harder to understand. But you actually need to get to the point where you can understand it, even if we start talking about X's and Y's. Yeah. Right. So I'll tend to go from something really concrete, real world. Geography always works to teach it. And then you start going into more abstract examples. But we're, we're on this abstract example now. So if you go to the grocery store, you must cry. And then I'll say, you already said it, Ben. Mm-hmm. Oh, so if I'm crying, then... And if anybody goes, you have to be at the grocery store, I go, eh, wrong. Yeah. And I'll also say, okay, if you go to the grocery store, you have to cry. So if I don't go to the grocery store, then... <laughs> and if someone says, you don't cry, I go, eh, wrong. Yeah. Right. Those are the two. The first thing there was what we call a mistaken reversal. And the second thing was what we call a mistaken negation. And both of those are fucking up the contrapositive. And if you fuck up the contrapositive, you have confused sufficient for necessary, according to the LSATs, you know, language that they have always used forever. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'll, and then I will elicit the correct contrapositive, which again, the rule was if you go to the grocery store, you have to cry. And then I'll say, so if I'm not crying and then everyone goes, well, you didn't go to the grocery store and I go ding, ding, ding. Yay. See that? What you guys just did was the contrapositive. The contrapositive is common sense, but you do need to have a magic formula memorized for the contrapositive, which is you switch the order and you switch the signs. Yeah. And if you do just one of those, you are making the LSAT's most common flaw, which is called confusing sufficient for necessary, which is on every single test. It's funny that you talk about going from intuitive to abstract examples, because I I do do the same thing. I start with intuitive examples, and then I go to abstract examples. My abstract examples usually have to do with apples and bananas, sort of like... (laughs) If you eat a banana, then you have to eat an apple. Yeah, it's like, well, that you know, no one has any real world experience with that because that's just ridiculous. Um, but can you figure out what must be necessary and sufficient in those contexts? And then I like to go to counterintuitive examples, so things that run against your real world experience, and see if you can still follow the rule. I kind of have a favorite one. Do you think we're yeah. ready for that? Yeah, yeah, go. I love this. Go. Okay, so here's the here's the if then statement. So, dear listeners, pay attention closely and see if you can figure out what must be true given what's said. So, if you win the race tomorrow. So, imagine for a second that you're running in a half marathon tomorrow. If you win that race tomorrow, then you will get $10,000. And that's true for anyone who's competing in that race. 
Now, <clears throat> fast forward to tomorrow, and we find out that Sarah has been given $10,000. What do we know must be true? I know nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we know nothing. The rule was that if she wins the race, then she would get $10,000. In other words, if she wins a race, that's the sufficient condition, then she necessarily must get $10,000. Uh, we then learned that she got $10,000. So our gut reaction is to be like, oh, she must have won. But that's not necessarily true. We know that winning would guarantee that she got that money, but it didn't say that there weren't other ways to get that money. And what I often like to do is say to people, well, is it possible that everyone who participated in the race got $10,000? And, of course, some people are like, yes, yeah, I guess that's possible. Most people resist that still. They're like, but you said if you win, <laughs> yep. then you get $10,000. I'm like, yes, that is 100% true. That is not inconsistent with the idea that everyone who participates gets $10,000. Because if it's true that everyone who participates, all 500 runners – gets $10,000, then is it not also true that if you win, you will get $10,000? And I guess because it's just counter to our real world experience, people are still like, but, 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 why would you say that? Why would you right. say if you win, then you get $10,000? It's like, I don't know. The LSAT says a lot of crazy shit, but like... <laughs> It doesn't matter. What's the if-then statement? What do you know must be true? And what do you not know? That's ultimately what they're testing. Seems like a good example to talk about the difference between if, only if, and if and only if. Mm -hmm. Sure. I, th I think in common sense usage, we frequently mean if and only if, right? Like mm -hmm. if you win the race tomorrow, you get $10,000. In, in kind of everyday usage, you might mean if and only if, where you're going to get 10000 if you win, you're also not going to get 10000 if you don't. Yeah, and this is this actually raises another just like point. Sorry to go tangent here a little bit, but when people are making these mistakes, when they hear me say, if you win, then you get $10,000, and they assume that if you don't win, then you won't get $10,000, which is what you're saying, if and only if, then uh, that's actually a good thing. Because in life, people don't communicate completely every single facet of their idea, right? They just say enough to convey the meaning that they're trying to convey. And we make assumptions all the time. We fill in gaps all the time. We go, oh, yeah, so that means if you don't win, you're probably not going to get the $10,000. I'm going to work my ass off and try to win this race. So it it's not like you're making a mistake in everyday speech. It's just that technically what was said doesn't tell you anything about what happens if you don't win. Yeah, it's only so, half of the rule that you are interpreting. So the yeah. missing piece, it, it might be a good spot to change the rule. Can I add one word to your Absolutely. rule? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. So your rule was um, if you win the race, you will get $10,000. Yep. I'm going to change that. I'm going to add the word only to sure. the beginning of your rule. So now, mm -hmm. now the rule becomes only if you win the race tomorrow will you get $10,000. Yeah. So what does that do then? Now, that let me, let me, I'll give you the test. Mm, Again, sure. the rule is only if you win the race tomorrow, will you get $10,000? Sarah won the race. <laughs> what do you it. know? I love it. We don't know anything. <laughs> yep. Perfect. But, yeah. People are going to be like, wait, wait, wait. Only if you win the race, do you get $10,000. So she won. She won. Right? <laughs> she has to get the money. You can't rip her off like that. <laughs> Oh man, we could be great like race organizers, couldn't we? <laughs> Just get pe get tons of people out there, and no one gets the money. Advertise anyway. it, yeah. yeah. Only if, yeah. What the hell? You guys said that only if we. They'd say if no, they'd say actually walk up to us and say you said if you win the race, then you get the money. No, we didn't. We said I'm gonna only <laughs> if you win the race, then you get the money. Which I'm gonna means, say this is like I could see a law school doing this with like a you know <laughs> only if you apply to our school. Will you get a five hundred dollar gift card for our <laughs> <laughs> our bookstore? And it's like everyone in the world applies, and then they're like, "Where's my five hundred bucks?" And then they go, 
hey, no, <laughs> legally speaking, only if you apply will you get $500. You applied. You don't have to get the four, five. Hey, only if introduces a necessary condition, not yeah. a sufficient condition. It's necessary to apply in order in order to possibly get the $500. But no, we have no obligation under the rule only if you apply will you get $500. <laughs> now, that is do- that's totally counterintuitive, right? This is... Weird shit that really you're probably only going to see on, well, the LSAT and like actually looking at a statute. Yeah. Or or contracts or or a regulation or a contract or something like that. This is very much lawyer shit. Yeah. So only if introduces the necessary condition. So what you were saying, only if you win, will you get $10,000? That means that if you get $10,000, then necessarily you must have won, but it does not mean that if you won, you'd get $10,000. Right, because that was what the if rule does. Yeah, the if rule, if you win, then you get $10,000, says, hey, look, winning guarantees you this money. But only if you win will you get $10,000. That's saying that if you get the $10,000, then you must have won only in those circumstances would you have gotten the $10,000. So to answer your question, if we know that Sarah had won, we have no idea whether or not she would have gotten the money. And that's what the LSAT likes to test. So the key here is that if introduces the sufficient condition and only if introduces the necessary condition. Yeah, and when you combine the two together, Mm -hmm. it it does achieve a more common sense understanding, right? Right. You have to combine both of them together into if and only if. Mm -hmm. So again, if and only if you win the race, will you get Mm $10,000? What that does is it means that both if you win the race, you get $10,000 and only if you win the race, will you get $10,000? It means that both of those rules are active. Those those rules are actually completely independent of one another. Mm Mm-hmm. But now if and only if makes both of the rules active simultaneously so that if you win, you get 10 grand. And if you don't win, you don't get 10 grand. Yeah. Uh, One shortcut here is to remember that if and only if or if but only if is a double arrow. In other words, the if then relationship is going both ways because both clauses are now sufficient and both clauses are now necessary. Yeah, it makes it so that you can't fuck up the contrapositive. There's really no such thing as the contrapositive. It's just either both of these things are true or both of these things are false and that's it. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So we've talked about sufficient. We've talked about necessary. I think we should talk about only if like (laughs) there's some other good examples I like to do. Um, For example, if I said to you, I will date someone only if they're wealthy what does that mean? So I think that's actually the the more common sense or intuitive sentence. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And I would break that down. I mean, you, you need to memorize that only if introduces a necessary condition. Yep. And so wealthy was the thing that came after the only if. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you'll date someone only if they're wealthy yep. means that if you are dating someone, mm-hmm. I then know that they are wealthy. Yeah. Or another way of talking about that in the contrapositive would be if someone is not wealthy, then I know for sure that you are not dating them. Yeah. I can also give you both of the flaws. Yeah. Which would be so and so is wealthy, therefore Ben has to be dating them. Yeah. And I would say, no, wealthy was necessary, not sufficient. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess the other way of doing it, Ben is not dating someone, therefore they are not wealthy. Yeah. Uh, which again, no, ne- wealthy is necessary for Ben to date them, but it's not like Ben has to date every wealthy person. Yeah. According yeah. to that rule. Good. So that's only if. Well, I mean, but yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say a quick shortcut is true if you're thinking of these things visually is you can just draw an arrow through the only if. So if I say I will date someone only if they are wealthy, you draw that arrow through the only if 
and it's pointing from dating, the if clause, to uh, wealthy, the then clause. Yeah, that's a nifty one. I like to do that on the whiteboard sometimes in class. Um, okay, so I think we've covered definitions of sufficient and necessary and contrapositive. Mm-hmm. I think we have dis- we've talked about the sufficient necessary flaw enough. Mm-hmm. I think we have two more things that I want to cover. I, I want to talk about unless, and I want to talk about to, to maybe to wrap it up, like what all this means and should we be doing a lot of fancy diagramming of conditional reasoning type arguments when we encounter them on the LSAT? Yes, we should definitely do fancy diagramming. The more it's, <laughs> it's the fancier, the better, <laughs> you know, like it's gotta be, yeah, you gotta cover up your page with, uh, with all these arrows yeah. and things. <laughs> Sorry. I just liked your term there. Yeah. Diagramming, really doesn't work for the vast majority of test takers. I like uh, the thing that you like to say. If you know how to diagram, then you often don't need to. And if you don't know how to diagram, well, then you don't know how to diagram. And as you start doing so, you end up just getting more confused. And that's uh, we see that all the time, right? Someone switches it as they diagram it, and you're like, oh, now it's just going down the wrong road. Or they use the wrong symbol, right? Like they use L in one case and then they use um, T in another case, but they actually mean the same thing. So they don't see how they're related. And now you're not really taking advantage of the stuff that you've diagrammed and you just miss it because you're making it abstract. Totally. And it's this is one of the most pervasive forms of LSAT dogma that, you know, I, whoever invented LSAT prep in the first place, I don't know if it was like Princeton review or Kaplan or whatever, but whoever like started first preparing people for the LSAT, they, the way they taught it was with a bunch of, uh, uh, really like complicated, um, abstract diagrams and it got into every LSAT book somehow. And when I was a baby LSAT teacher, 10 years ago, I was, I I like thought that this was a critical part of how you teach the LSAT. Mm -hmm. And so I would spend a lot of time doing all these complicated diagrams on the whiteboard and stuff. But on LSAT logical reasoning questions, especially, I feel like it just doesn't help you to understand the content of what you're reading. Like you have to be able to read a few sentences and just kind of parse them and combine shit together in your head and really identify with it and understand it. Yeah. I, I, so I was sitting with a, a, a tutoring really high level tutoring student yesterday and you know, she's scoring solidly in the one seventies and she had printed out and brought me like 10 different logical reasoning questions. And I could see on her pages, she had all this diagramming. And normally these days when I see all the diagramming like that, I'm just like, well, that's why you missed it. Mm -hmm. Because you, what I think happens is that maybe, I mean, tell me if this is, seems like it rings true to you. You know how on the reading comp, sometimes people take notes as an excuse for not actually understanding what they're reading. Sure. Or they underline as an excuse for not understanding what they're reading. I think on the logical reasoning on these you know, arguments that have a lot of conditionals in them. I think people start doing a diagram and they just like use that as an excuse for like, Oh, well I don't have to actually engage with this. I can just write it down. And it seems like that's what this student was doing because Mm -hmm. she, she brought me all these questions that she had had such a hard time with and she ended up narrowing it down on like all of them. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't tell between this one and this one. Mm Mm-hmm. And I go, okay, well, let's cover up the answer choices and I'm going to read the argument to you. And I'd read like one sentence and then I'd read another sentence and I'd go, hey, you know, those two do connect and I'm not making a diagram. I'm not drawing it out, but I'm like, you know, if this, then that, and if that, then this other thing, Mm -hmm. well, then if this, then that, then this other thing. And turns out it was like six questions in a row I did that. And that was actually the answer. Like it was Mm -hmm. just right there on the page. That was the answer. What I said 
before I was even done reading the argument, what I had just said already the answer. Yeah. And she was like <laughs> smacking herself upside the head at that point because she had just brutally overcomplicated it mm. by trying to, by trying to, I think quickly jot down the conditionals and the contrapositives and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. But without like just actually engaging. I agree. I think this example is a good one. Yeah. You want to read it? Yeah. The argument? This is uh, the June 2007 LSAT, right? For people who want to look it up. I think it's number six from section two of June 2007. Yeah. Okay. So it says an undergraduate degree is necessary for appointment to the executive board. So. <laughs> If you had your pencils ready and you're ready to start diagramming, I could see people saying, okay, an undergraduate degree is necessary for appointment to the executive board. They see undergraduate degree first in this sentence. So they write UD arrow A for appointment, (laughs) right? And already you're off and running in the wrong direction. Yeah, completely. That's that's, First of all, it's not what this is saying. Second of all, you've just taken undergraduate degree and turned it into UD, which is an abstract thing, and then A for appointment. (laughs) Whereas if you could just listen to it, like everyone else in the world who doesn't care about the LSAT, you'd say, oh, an undergraduate degree is necessary for appointment to the executive board. In other words, if I want to get on that board, then I have to have an undergraduate degree. Or if I don't have one, then I can't get appointed to that board. Yeah, it's amazing how the abstraction can make you misunderstand because no one in their right mind would ever think that if you get an undergraduate degree, you're automatically on the executive board. Yeah. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. No, no, no. It's if someone's on the executive board, then you know that they have to have an undergraduate degree. Or if they don't have the degree, then they can't be on the board. Duh. And it's a very easy idea. It's not an e- an idea that you need to write down uh, to apply it to other ideas or to integrate it with other ideas as you try to figure out what must be true um, or to remember it. It's just like, okay, it's it actually is unsurprising, right? To get on the executive board, you better have an undergrad degree. Okay, cool. Now that I understand this and everybody's nodding their head, you say, next sentence, further, okay, so we're about to get another premise, it sounds like. No one with a felony conviction can be appointed to the board. Huh. All right. So I got to have a degree and I can't have a felony. So far, this argument is totally unsurprising and makes sense to me. Yeah. And if I start diagramming, (laughs) if I was going to do it correctly, I would have executive board, two arrows coming out of executive board. Two arrows coming out. Yep. One that goes to undergraduate degree and one that goes to not a felony. Not a felony. Yep. But looking at this abstraction that I've drawn here, that in no way helps me to understand this shit. (laughs) It's not like I, I did not need that. I did not need this diagram to understand that, you know, you can't have a felony and you have to have an undergraduate degree in order to be on the board. Let's talk about that diagram for a second. So it's, if are you using A for appointed or what are you? I uh, no, I put E B. Oh, executive board. Okay, so you say uh, E B arrow U D. Is that what you're using? Yep. For, yep. And then you have another arrow coming out of E B yep. going to um, a felony. Is it just F or F C? It's F crossed off. F crossed off, right? And so <clears throat> it's like now you have that in front of you, and how many people look at that? And through some convoluted way, start saying to themselves, oh, okay, so (laughs) if you don't have a felony conviction, you must be on the executive board. Or somehow they like connect the two necessary conditions because they're both connected through – I'm sorry. They connect the felony conviction or not having a felony conviction with – the undergraduate degree, right? It's like, uh, yep. they, they don't necessarily have anything to do with each other. Um, but we just start making assumptions when we look at these drawings. Yep. Anyway, right now in everyday plain English, we understand that if you want to get on this board, you have to have an undergraduate degree and you better not have a felony conviction. Yep. Makes sense. Thus Murray, an accountant with both a bachelor's and a master's, 
cannot be accepted for the position of executive administrator since he has a felony conviction. Okay, wait a second here. The first two premises were about getting on the executive board. This conclusion is about Murray being accepted for the position of executive administrator. Does that have anything to do with the executive board? Maybe they both use the word executive, but I have no idea. Like, could <laughs> um, an executive administer be something outside the board? I don't know. Yeah. And what you did right there was you skipped right to the right answer because you're actually understanding that, hey, it's not that big of a deal. In order to get on the board, you have to have these two things, an undergraduate degree, no felony. But the trick in this is that Murray, who does have the degree, sorry, though, Murray has a felony. What do we know about Murray? We know he can't be on the board. Can't be on the executive board. And I think if you... When you get into the abstractions, hey, executive board and executive administrator both start with E. Mm -hmm. And I think that it would be very easy. In fact, I think it's the entire point of this question. It's very easy to see the felony and go, oh, well, yeah, so this argument is totally valid. Like, regardless of the degree, it's irrelevant because you can't have a felony to be on the executive board. Therefore, Murray can't be executive administrator. What's up? Yeah. Like, like they would read it and go, yep, that sounds right. But yep. then the question stem here says the argument's conclusion follows logically if which one of the following is assumed. That's a sufficient assumption question, which means that there's something missing. Mm -hmm. uh, and we don't even have the answer choices here in front of us. But the, the point of the whole question is, hey, hold on. If the executive administrator is on the executive board, mm -hmm. then yeah. But I think that this is a great example of one where doing a diagram would actually hide that from you especially if you used e for executive board yeah just e mm -hmm. <laughs> instead of eb yep okay so do you want to make any final remarks in this uh our maybe first lesson we didn't cover unless uh, we could quickly say unless means if not yeah i've found that that tends to confuse people without examples but that is true and we will definitely talk about that i guess the long and short of it is that the if clause in an if-then statement is a sufficient condition. It guarantees the then clause will happen. The then clause is the necessary condition because it has to happen if the if clause happens. And um, the contrapositive is simply the negation of both of those clauses and flip them. Like you just have to switch and negate. Yeah. I, I guess my final remarks about this would be you have to understand the sufficient and necessary flaw. If you understand the flaw, if you can come up with an example of it on your own and feel good about it, then that means you understand what it is to be sufficient. You understand what it is to be necessary. You understand the contrapositive and you're on the right track. I promise you, if you don't understand this, you are not going to reach your full potential on the LSAT. And yeah. I don't care how long it takes you. You have to master this concept. This is a foundation. Uh, this is a fundamental that is just 100% critical. You, mm -hmm. you will not be successful on the test if you don't get over the hump on sufficient and necessary. I think sometimes people give up because they read some shitty explanation of it somewhere else or they had a class that just didn't do a good job of explaining it, you know, and they missed a few of these questions and then they just, ah, I'll move on. I'll work on something else. Yeah. But boy, you're going to just get beat up on this test if you don't master. Um, it's really common sense, very simple issue, but you have to get over the hump on it. So keep grinding, keep asking us questions. Um, Got to get there. Yeah. Ready to go live for the first time ever? Let's try it out, dude. Yeah. So what, <laughs> let's see how this I'm going to hit this button that says live video. Uh, cool. Well, hey, thanks everybody for um, bearing with us. Um, we had a lot of technical difficulties uh, trying to set up our first ever Facebook Live. So I completely forgot what this event was about in the uh, the, the complete failure to launch, but I now remember. <laughs> <laughs> it's about right. just do it. So yeah. uh, we're going to talk about different ways to get people motivated, uh, just to get their act together and start doing stuff. I guess my question to you, Nathan, would be what's your number one thing to get like going, to get started? 
We just get the question all the time. Like people love to ask questions about how, like what the perfect study plan study schedule is, right? People all the time, like they just want to say, hey, what, you know, how much should I be doing? What should I do first? Like, should I do your books or should I do your videos or should I do whatever? Mm -hmm. And my response these days is the more time you spend talking about what you should do, the less possible LSAT tests are like 10% different. Yeah. They're, they're like, it's just whatever, just get on it. Yeah. Cool. Um, what else is on our agenda? Well, I'm actually just curious, like what people who are joining us have questions about just anything. I mean, I see people coming in, coming out. I'm wondering what, what they want yeah. to know. If somebody here wants to ask a question, feel free. We can monitor the chat. Ben, what is this thing with Rachel's iterations? Oh, yeah, iterate. Iterate is this idea of just like go and do something and fail and then don't worry about whether or not you're doing it just right. Just go try to do something, and if it seems like you're going in the right direction, then just keep going. By the way, do we, we just got a question. Where the heck do we see that? Yeah, I, I'll read it. Celeste says, what minority characteristics, if any, should be acknowledged during the application slash essay process as an incentive for acceptance? Uh, example, a member of the LGBTQ community, Army veteran, et cetera. It sounds like Celeste, she might be thinking about two different things at the same time, right? In a personal statement, I could definitely see why you might want to write about your Army veteran experience. That's like professional experience. That seems like a great spot to talk about that. I think if you're going to talk about minority characteristics or LGBTQ community stuff, I think that you should probably be putting that into a diversity statement. Those are two separate essays. Law schools are genuinely interested in diversity and they will ask you questions on the application about how you're going to bring diversity to the law school classroom. And if you can answer in the affirmatively, I think you should definitely say yes. You should check the boxes and you should write an, an addendum to your application. I don't know that you should be making your entire personal statement about minority aspects, right? Or diversity aspects. What do you think, Ben? Yeah, I mean, I would try to focus on your strengths and ultimately that's what they they want to see you regardless. So I saw somebody on the Facebook group uh, just recently, or maybe it was an email we got. I don't, I don't know what it was, but it was like someone had seen a whole bunch of sample personal statements that like a, that a school had given out. And they said that they were like very negative, very look at all this trauma I've been through. And uh, oh, thanks, Samantha, for the uh camera angle advice. <laughs> I'll try to fix it. I don't even know how without using my phone. It sucks. If it was on my laptop, I'd be able to do it. But on my phone, it's much harder. Is that better? Uh, I, I think like this whining about stuff you've been through, I feel bad for the stuff you've been through. I just don't think that that's the appropriate thing to be talking about on your personal statement, because on your personal statement, they want to see you as, wow, this person is going to kick ass as a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And so I want to see you like professionally kicking ass. That's what I really want your personal statement to be about. Ben? Yeah, I agree. Um, which comes back to what we always say, focus on facts, right? What you've done and that proves what you're going to do. And put your best foot forward. I mean, just like, yeah, we don't need all the conclusions about about great things you've done. We just need to see the action. Just give me the action part. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Tell me a story from a job or military or an academic experience. The later, the better though, like a senior in college or grad school or whatever. Show me you creating something new, organizing something, bringing people together, winning something. I want to see like, a winner. That's, I, I think people don't get that. They just want to start with all these sob stories and personal, like people start writing about flaws in their own character. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> that's not, you, you only have two pages. Like you get to the good stuff about you. you. Everybody else in the world might say bad stuff about you, but you need to be saying basically like showing me the good stuff. 
Yeah. All right. Want to read? The, can you see the questions now, Ben? I can't see the questions, but I do remember them. Um, so I can read them. Jam okay. says, if you finish three reading comp passages and have uh, only have three to four minutes to spare, how should we use those minutes? I would just start reading the passage. And <laughs> when you're done, answer the first question. And if you still have time, answer the next question. I think that's right. I think it you should be potentially able to read the passage in three or four minutes and answer the main point question. That's what I'd be looking at. I'd also <clears throat> make sure you've bubbled in the answers that you haven't gotten to. Oh, well, we do that at the five minute warning normally, right? If you're someone who's not going to be finishing the sections, you should be bubbling in guesses when the proctor says five minutes. That way you're sure you get all those free points. Carolyn says, would you all consider it an effective use of time to retake one of your classes while the online class is still available? I think that really depends on whether taking the live class helps you get work done. Like some, I, 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 there are people all the time who just say when I, like they take the class and then they study on their own and later they decide to take it again because they're like, I do more work when I know I have a class that's going on and I come in and do it. Other people actually get less work done. I mean, they do better if they just stay at home. They've already taken the class. They know what they want to focus on, and the class is going to focus on other things. Thanks, Carolyn. Okay, uh, Victoria says, I know it essentially doesn't matter at all, but how do you practice for the essay portion of the LSAT? I feel stumped trying to write them during the test, and I have no idea what a good one sounds like. Oh, wow. Ben, well, we have uh, free videos about this, right? 15-minute video you could watch and just be done with it. It's like the easiest thing in the world. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'll just tell you this really quickly. Your structure is going to look like this. It's going to be so-and-so should do X because they're going to ask you, hey, uh, so-and-so has two options. They can either do X or Y. What should they do? And your first sentence should just be so-and-so should do X if you think that they should do X or if you think they should do Y, then have them do Y. But that's your first sentence. And then you have three or four paragraphs explaining why. And then you just say, hey, look, for those reasons, so-and-so should do X if you want to wrap it up. Yeah. And the main, yeah. Thing, the main thing to keep in mind is that when you make this argument for why they should do option X, uh, there's going to be facts that they give you that go against that decision. And you want to make sure to address those. And the easiest way to address them is just to say, hey, although this other way is cheaper, they should still do X because of whatever reason. So make sure to concede your weaknesses, just like the LSAT does, and then, but then counter them. Totally. Yep. That's it in a nutshell. There's not much to it. One sentence introduction that clearly states your recommendation. One sentence conclusion that says, for the above reasons, they should do this. In the middle, all it is mostly is reasons why they should do what you want them to do. As Ben says, acknowledge one or two points from the other side to make yourself look even handed, even though you're actually not. Never, ever practice the writing sample. Not even once. Go watch a video. I have a video. Ben has a video. 15 minutes. That's all you need to know about the writing sample. Okay. Jam says GPA addendum question. You often say to recalculate a GPA at the end minus the bad class or two that you are explaining. However, if you are in a situation where you had three poor years, took time off, and then came back for three semesters of a 3.9, would you still recommend recalculating the GPA the same way? Ben, you want to take that one? You often say to recalculate a GPA? Well, as a, in a GPA I, addendum, if you had one bad class, oh, right, you oh, could I say, see. hey, if, uh, yeah. but for this one F for a class that I just didn't even, whatever it was, I didn't know I was registered for it yeah. or I failed it for whatever reason. Without that oh, class, yeah. my GPA is this. That's a fact. And so you can present that fact. But what do you think if it's three poor years and then you took time off for three semesters of a 3.9? You can't recalculate your yeah. GPA without three years, can you? <laughs> I don't think there's – so wait, let me get this straight. It's coming back and having three semesters of a 3.9, yeah. which is actually a decent streak, right? It's not one semester. Right. I had one semester of a 3.9. Um, I think that – I think I would just – I, the thing about facts is that they're, they're not offensive in any way. Okay. I, most facts. Some facts could be seen as kind of anal. But I think if you say, is there some – how long? You took, 
You took uh, time off. I wonder how long the time off was. Uh, hopefully, the longer the better. I, I think the longer so too, the yeah. you can be like, hey, look, I I like I got my act together, and now I have a three point nine. End of story. You don't need to make excuses. Don't need to explain why you're more capable now. People always say this. They say, I think this is more reflective of my ability as a student. Just just, just say it. I got a 3.9 in my last three yeah, semesters. They, they feel like they have to say their conclusion. Like, this demonstrates that I am going to be a successful law student and lawyer and blah, blah, blah. It's like, <laughs> no, let them reach their own conclusion on that. You don't need to say any of that. The, like, on this, for, for this addendum, um, for JAM, I, I would keep it to like two sentences. <laughs> like as soon as it becomes two paragraphs, I almost guarantee that it's going to be oversharing and just too much mm -hmm. conclusions and not enough, like just simple facts. Three, 3.9. Most recent three semesters, 3.9. And that's it. Um, uh, Shabana says, I took the Kaplan online class twice and bombed the LSAT twice. Should I give up? Oh, I'm sorry. That sucks. No, don't give up. That you, you don't have a good you don't have a good class to point to. So for one, you took maybe the worst LSAT class there is when you took Kaplan. For two, for two you only took the LSAT twice. Many people take the LSAT four or five times. Yeah, it's our, also it, I feel like Kaplan not only doesn't help you, I feel like it often hurts people. So it's who knows what you could do with a real LSAT class with people that know what they're talking about. Yeah, I, I mean, if you're if you really want to be a lawyer, then this shouldn't stop you. You know, you should continue kicking. You should continue busting ass on your LSAT prep until you get where you need to go. That's that's my advice. Samuel says, how should we consider different advice from different takers? Also, as someone starting out, what are the most important strategies to learn early on? So I would say uh, uh, when you consider the advice of other test takers, if they did well, I mean, first of all, you want to make sure that they did well. Keep in mind that they're giving advice based on what worked for them, right? Um, and so I don't think it's bad to consider it. It could definitely give you a takeaway that would be very beneficial to you, but also take it with a grain of salt because a lot of times the advice that I'm giving, especially when I first started teaching, was based on what worked well for me. And then over time, that advice has changed to based on what seems to work for the vast majority of test takers. I always say, look, what I'm telling you may not be the best approach for you. But the reality is, is that it seems to work for most people. So I've adjusted my advice based on that. Totally. Yeah. And as far as, I mean, if you listen to the pearls versus turds on the Thinking LSAT podcast, you would know that much or most of the advice that's out there is not really, we don't recommend it. And so listening to different test takers, I mean, they've got a lot of crazy strategies. Like it could even be, hey, I got a 165. You should listen to everything I have to say about the LSAT. But those strategies might have actually been holding them back from a 170 or a 175, right? You don't know what they might have scored if they would have used different strategies. So they, don't, they think they know, but they don't actually know. A 165 does not make you any kind of an expert on the LSAT. You also have a lot of like correlation causation issues where people will do one different thing and then their score will jump and they'll attribute it to that change in their strategy. It's like, uh, why don't you take a few more tests and see if that really had anything to do with it? Right. Totally. As far as Samuel's second question, what are the most important strategies to learn early on? I Can we just refer you back, Samuel, to the LSAT fundamentals series that we've been doing on the podcast? I mean, we've got a few hours worth of I think really high quality content. It starts around episode 176, something like that, where mm -hmm. we, was it 176 or 177? It was like, the first one was just, hey, where do we start with LSAT prep? And then the second one was, um, you know, we, we started going into the different section types and stuff. So please I, just refer back to that stuff. Let's see. Oh, we have a thank you about not reading the question stem first. Yeah, you're welcome. I took the LSAT in 2017 and took the writing along with that test. Of course, I'm back to studying again and registered for the July test. Do I need to take the writing sample again? It's been two years. 
Call LSAC. Yeah, <laughs> we don't know. I don't think I think you're gonna have to take it again. I don't think they're keeping that until they've implemented this new process. Oh, I thought that they had <laughs> said that if you had ever taken it in writing, you. But it might still. You're gonna have to call LSAC. They're really good on the phone. Their website sucks. Pick up the phone, call LSAC, and ask them that question. And please write us the write uh, help at thinking LSAC when you do, and let us know because we will then put out a PSA for everybody. Josh asks you, Ben, yeah. if you have any books. I do have books. Um, they're not on Amazon. They're all just in my class. Yeah. Sign up for Ben's class if you want to get Ben's books. Um, Adam says, yeah. I have a chronic problem with logical reasoning. Almost across the board with all of my practice tests, I always do solidly on the first LR section, but then proceed to get nearly double the amount of incorrect answers on the second LR section. Is this an issue we have seen with our students? What do we think we can do to avoid it in the future? Adam, I'm really curious how many times that's actually happened. Uh, if it's really happened a lot, I also want to know what you mean by double. Like, are we talking that you get like two wrong and now you're getting four wrong? That's no different in my mind. But if you're getting six wrong and 12 wrong consistently over lots and lots of tests, we're talking like 10, 15 tests, then maybe you're just getting tired. And uh, otherwise, I would be curious whether this is actually something that's happening. Small sample is my hypothesis. I always hear people say it both the way um, that he's saying it and the opposite way. I hear people say that they always do worse on the first section. And I, my hypothesis is like small sample. In addition to Ben, I think, sure, getting tired might be a thing, but also I would just ask, hey, are you maybe doing something different on that second section? Like, can you think about what you might be doing differently? Are you attempting more questions? Are you attempting fewer questions? Maybe tune into that a little bit because it could be that you're just like rushing on the second <laughs> section or something. Yeah. I don't really know. Get better at the content of the test overall. Like you're going to do better on one section than you are on the other one. I don't think it's going to be consistent, but one section is always going to be better than the other one. That's just how shit works. And if you just raise your overall level, then you'll raise your good section and your poor section. You'll still have a, a difference between the two sections, but I, I don't think that that needs to be consistent at all. Um, Jam has a question about the demon says blind review with the demon is difficult because when you go back to the question you got wrong, the correct answer is highlighted. Is there any way to prevent this? And there is, Ben. What is that way? Yeah, so when you go to the uh, study history page, you have an option to redo the question or to go right to the help. I think it is true that if you go to the help, the correct answer is highlighted. But if you redo the question, then there's no help and no highlighting. Maybe you're asking about when you go to the help, do you want that highlight off? Um, and that's definitely something I've, we could work well, on. Well, I've also heard people say that you just click the back button. So if you if you answer it and you go to the next page and you realize you got it wrong, just click back and it'll take you back to the question without the right answer highlighted. And then you can answer it again. Uh, random side note here. There was an issue when you went back, it would record the answer is wrong, but we have fixed that issue as of yes, actually this morning. So hopefully that's no longer happening. Of course, we always open to feedback <laughs> as people continue to pile in to the system. Celeste wants to know how helpful we think the LSAC forums are and any tips to make the most of the one day event. Huh? Oh, oh. LSAC forums. Um, Should people go? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. I'm re I actually did find the comments now. Oh. So, um, okay. Um, yeah, what, do, what did Anne Levine say about this? I feel like I, I always have a ho-hum attitude towards these, but I don't feel like they're not helpful if you go in there and ask questions. I'm trying to remember what Anne said. I wouldn't go out of my way to go to them. I, I Like, if it's in your town, fine. If you don't have to, like, miss anything big, fine. But if you have to, like, travel 300 miles and get a hotel and everything, it's going to be a bunch of law schools sitting around at tables, handing out brochures. And, you know, you might be able to make a connection, like an actual connection at one or two of those schools, but it's going to be really like playing the long game. And, you know, you're going to have to show up like looking professional, being professional, mm -hmm. learn somebody's name and have a meaningful conversation with them, not just like, 
hey, what sort of clinics do you guys have? You know, like where you're just asking a stupid question that you could totally solve from their website. Um, yeah. It, they can be really useful for gathering fee waivers. Ask them for an application fee waiver and also ask them to waive your LSAC uh, report fee of $45. Mm. That's one of the best reasons to go. I mean, I think you can get lots of free applications to schools. But yeah, I mean, I feel like that connection can be useful. Um, but stepping back, the best use of your time is is the LSAT and your personal statement. I, assuming your GPA is already done. <laughs> ben, you can sh chime in if there's one of these questions. Otherwise, I'll just keep reading them. I keep going. That's fine. OK, Caitlin says, I wanted to thank you for your tip to wake up early in the morning and study before work. If you have a full time job, it's made a world of difference for me. Are there any other tips you have for a full time worker? who is juggling their job and studying for the LSAT. I think that, so studying early is good. I also feel like I was just talking to someone yesterday and they said that they work at a law firm. And if any of you work at a law firm, you know that the hours can be demanding. If the work needs to get done, it needs to get done. But one thing that he decided to do was study in a conference room before he left work and just order food out he's like yeah it'll cost money to get that food but if i just go right from work to that conference room then two hours later my phone's off i've done the studying and then when i pop out of there it doesn't matter what happens but if he leaves work and he hasn't studied then he gets sucked into other things it just always happens and then the night's over and it's like oh well i guess i'll study tomorrow so i feel like just finding a way to shut yourself out from the world and making it happen before you do something else, before you eat dinner or before you go to the gym or whatever, commit to doing it before you know it's going to happen. Yeah. If there's something that you do every day that you know you're going to do, commit to doing it before the LSAT before doing that thing. And then it just starts happening. Um, yeah, another quick thing might be to do the LSAT demon while you're actually at work. You know, it, <laughs> people do it. People are doing it. They're sitting there that's doing like that. That's a, that's a very common comment. Yeah. <laughs> I can study at work and no one knows what I'm doing. Yeah. So, I, yeah. I don't know. Or encouraging. on the train or on the bus or whatever, you know, people are squeezing in a few questions here and there. Um, I think that is helping people, uh, busy people balance. So, um, all right, cool. Chelsea. I can't believe how many oh, go ahead. the demon in their car. How many? I can't believe how many people do the demon in their car. That was wild when I heard the, my LA class telling me that they were using the the text to voice feature on their phones uh, while they were sitting in traffic, and the demon was actually reading them logical reasoning questions and logical and reading them explanations uh, after they had answered the questions. So obviously we do not just, endorse this because we don't want people running people over. But yeah, well I've heard more people doing it since then, so I guess it's really a thing. It's a thing. Cool. Um, Chelsea is a little confused about our advice about the July test. She says the July test is most valuable if we already have another score on record. I'm registered for July. Should I also register for June? Yeah. Yeah. That way you can cancel and know that you're or keep it depending on whether it's higher or lower than your June score. And June is far enough away that I feel like you can make a lot of progress between now and then. Yeah. There's no reason to wait for July. Um, Wait, yeah, sign up for June, kill it in June. You could just withdraw from July or kill it in June and then take it in July. And if you get even one point higher, you get to keep your score. But if you don't have any scores on record when you head into July, then you don't. You should probably keep your score no matter what it is because you just yeah. need a score to go to law school. Yeah. Monica says, would you recommend blind reviewing? I've heard a few different versions of what blind review means and how different people blind review full tests. Could you explain a good method for reviewing full practice tests? I feel like I don't spend enough time reviewing. It's almost guaranteed that you don't spend enough time reviewing. Like nobody spends enough time reviewing. Yeah. Well, a couple things right off the bat. A lot of people will, in an effort to be like perfect, review everything. Yeah. And you don't need to review everything. No. Only review the questions that you got wrong and the ones that you weren't sure about. And I would say that early on in your prep, if you're not doing very well, if you're getting a lot of questions wrong, then you shouldn't even be reviewing the ones that you weren't sure about. You should just be starting with the ones that you got wrong. Um, it what we're, what we're trying to do here is – the amount of time you spend reviewing a full test is 
I'm not saying you, I guess, in particular. I'm just saying someone who's scoring, say, in the 150s is going to be about the same amount of time that someone spends reviewing that test in the 170s. It's just how many questions can you review? You're not going to review as many if you're in the 150s. The point is, though, after you take a test, do you have at least three or four concrete takeaways that you can apply to your next test? I want people to say things like, okay, um, I now understand the difference between correlation and causation, and I can recognize that, and I'm going to look for that in my next test. What I don't want to hear is, ooh, I'm going to read more carefully. I mean, that's probably a good thing to commit to. You probably do need to read more carefully, but it's kind of vague. And so I, I like it when people walk away from a test with more concrete um, advice for themselves and then can use that and apply it in their next test. And as long as you keep doing that, then every test is going to get a little bit better. Yeah. And that's all we're trying to do. Uh, yeah, I would say only review your mistakes. Uh, blind review your mistakes means you don't know what the answer is when you're redoing the question. You're redoing the question and trying to find the right answer. Um, as far as like a big picture thing, I would love for people to be more clear about their like accuracy level. When If you did 20 questions and you missed 10 of them, that just sucks. Like that's just not good. You're not, you're not doing it right. You got you to gotta be have a little higher standards for accuracy. And so when you review your sections or when you review your full tests, one thing to think about is just, okay, let's be honest. How many questions did I attempt? And of those questions that I attempted, what was my accuracy rate? Because if your accuracy rate was like anything lower than 80%, you're just not doing it carefully enough. You need to dig in more deeply. And that's one thing that I think you can, every time you do a section um, or a test, you can look at that accuracy rate and it's just like, it's not good to have accuracy of 70%. That it might look like that's good, but that's skimming the surface and just like not really getting paid for the work you're doing. Um, yeah. All right. Oliver says, I do way better when taking yeah. sections individually, like one per day, like one. than I do when taking a full length test. Um, low 170s versus high 150s. Hmm. Have you had students with similar problems? Do you know what they did to improve besides practice, of course? Um, That's extreme. My, That's a crazy difference. Yeah, I don't usually see that. But my guess is that you're probably thinking about the whole test as you're taking the sections rather than just thinking, my job right now is to do this section. And my job right now is really just to do this question. But uh, since you seem to do well with individual sections – just imagine a test as five individual sections. That's it. Not a bad tip. Yeah, I wonder if Oliver is maybe like, you know, oh, I had games first and I did poorly on it. So now I'm going to keep stewing on that during section two, section three, section four, or, you know, worrying about like, oh, you know, the games are still coming up or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. Taking it more seriously while you're doing the full test, yeah. The LSAT is divided yeah. up into 35-minute little fun games that you get to play. And if you can be good at them one at a time, you should be able to be good at it four times in a row, I, I think. Hey, so I was just going to say to Joshua, he was asking about the demon in the reports page. Yeah. If you don't mind emailing me just at Ben at Strategy Prep. That's the best way to resolve these issues. I'll take a look. And it's interesting. Sometimes some users have issues that others don't. So I'll try to figure it out. Carolyn. Oh, man. What about a GPA addendum for a bad senior year versus freshman year? Eight years out of school, but GPA was 3.75 until I realized college was actually fun and then got a 3.5 3.58 at the end so including that sounds like a terrible terrible senior year that's not a great look uh, in her favor she's been out of school for eight years i would focus on that maybe i just wouldn't talk about it yeah it is what it is because like you don't the whole point of an addendum is to bring a focus to something yeah. and so i wouldn't talk about it and i would just focus on your personal statement and your other stuff she could say she was sick I mean, it's a lie, but alcoholism is a disease. 
I don't know. Well, maybe you're <laughs> with fun. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, would, I, I don't know. I don't know that I would talk. I, I feel like even talking about it just brings attention. Yeah. To it. Write your personal statement about your professional achievements and make yourself look like a grown ass adult that is just like way removed from undergrad. 3.5 is not like a horrible GPA anyway. So just don't even, yeah, get a good, get a great LSAT score and point to your professional achievements and just, I, I wouldn't, yeah, that's a, not an addendum to write probably. Adam, yeah, never been able to access the reports sections. Yeah, email Ben. Okay, yeah, I'll take a look at that. Caitlin says she's <laughs> watching our video at work right now. Thank you, Caitlin. Cool. Beautiful. What's a good tip for making predictions in logical reasoning? That's a good question. So when it comes to logical reasoning, a lot of the prediction I feel like is happening as people read it when you're doing well. Yes. Like you read the first sentence, and you're like, huh, okay, like, what does that actually mean? And then what do I think this implies? What is going forward? I mean, you have to separate those two things because you have to be clear to yourself what has been said and what am I adding to this? You don't, I mean, I speculate all the time, but I recognize that my speculations are separate from what's being said. I think a lot of people make mistakes right. when they start assuming that what they're thinking has been said and it hasn't been said. But it's to me, I think most test takers are reading the first sentence, they're reading the second sentence, reading the third sentence, and then they're done. And it's like, well, what do you think? And they're like, um, I don't know. <laughs> and they go back and they start reading again. It's like, I want you to read the first sentence, have some sort of thought about what you think that means, and then read the second sentence. And the second sentence is not in a, coming to you in a vacuum. It's coming to you right after the first sentence. So how do those two sentences relate to each other? Or how do they... How do they seem like they might relate, but they actually don't, right? A lot of times the second sentence is trying to build off of the first, but they don't connect. And recognizing how the author is trying to connect them, but they ultimately don't connect is itself valuable. But if they do connect, then put two and two together and say, well, if the first sentence and the second sentence are true, what else must be true? In other words, your prediction is happening as you're reading each sentence. And then by the time you're done, you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, why did you draw that conclusion? That's not supported. Or, hmm, that's the same conclusion that I drew right before I read your conclusion. And so this argument must be valid. And then when the question says, what's the main conclusion of the argument? It's kind of like, yeah, I'm not surprised they're not asking me for the flaw because I don't think this argument is flawed. In other words, your prediction is happening right from the beginning, right from the get-go. There's two steps in my mind that I keep coming back to. Can you translate what they said in that sentence correctly? And now that you understand what that sentence is saying, where do you think they're going to go with that? I love it. Yeah. Think about what would the most skeptical, critical person in the world be thinking as they're reading this stuff? Like this might be your favorite lawyer, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. If this was a brief that was in front of, of RBG, and she's going to really like assess the quality of this thought. What would RBG be saying as she's reading this stuff? She's going to be reasonable too, right? Like sometimes people get this overly critical and they're sort of like nitpicking these stupid things. And you're like, um, okay, honestly, like, how do you feel about it? Like the LSAT is nitpicky. So yeah. when you are nitpicky, I think you need to say to yourself, hmm, I'm not sure if um, key, a key development is the same as, um, you know, a crucial development. Are those the same thing? Like, at the same time, realizing that they probably are. Like, saying, I could see them, uh, that seems synonymous, synonymous enough to me, but maybe there's a jump in reasoning here. Like, I just feel like sometimes people latch on to one thing, and then it actually prevents them from seeing a much bigger problem. So, I don't have a problem with, identifying issues, just make sure that you're also trying to be somewhat reasonable and saying, well, how much of an issue is this compared to this other issue? You also have to be willing to grant people their premises, right? So if, if you're, sometimes I'm reading, if I'll be reading the first sentence and I'll be, I'm not sure if this is a premise or the conclusion yet. If it's a premise, I, I'm going to have to grant you this premise, but if it's mm -hmm. a conclusion, I'm not buying it. You know, it's just, it's bullshit. So I'm thinking about it on like multiple levels at the same time. But as I'm engaging with the thought, I am then making predictions without even really trying. It has nothing to do with question type, by the way. My predictions are, do I like this argument or not? 
and not just no, it sucks, but here's why this argument sucks. Here's why this argument is broken, incomplete. Here's here's the big gap, you know, and then I can answer any question that they're gonna kind of get to me. Um, thanks, Shabana. Hunter says, do law schools consider how much Latin honors vary between schools? For example, at some schools, uh, Kamade might be the top 13%, but other schools are only 25 to 30%. Is there a way to highlight that on my resume? So my understanding is that law schools have all the undergrad schools kind of pinned down in terms of what their grades mean. And um, I think they have formulas for all of that. Like they're going to look at a GPA with a certain degree from Yale differently than the same GPA with a different degree <laughs> at some community college. I think they even know like the percentages of what that means. Okay. Um, yeah. I, to address the resume issue, particularly, I mean, I, I can see where if you're going to put your GPA on your resume or if you're going to put cum laude on your resume, I don't think there's anything wrong with putting parentheses top 13 percent. Right. Yeah. It doesn't hurt to highlight it. Yeah. If it's good. Yeah. You could certainly point it out. Victory says, at, uh, sorry, Victoria says, at what point should you go to a tutor instead of just using the demon? That's a good question. Frankly, a lot of this comes down to money, too. Like, if you have the money to hire a tutor, it probably would be more effective just to hire one at one point and just do a session and start figuring out right away, wait, is there ways that I'm approaching this that I shouldn't be approaching this or I could be doing differently? I would say the most common reaction I get from a tutoring session the first time I meet with someone is, oh, I've never dug into a question that much before. And now when I go home and I study on my own, I'm going to I'm going to do a lot more digging and really be honest with myself when I say, um, why is this answer wrong? Just yesterday I was talking to someone and she um, I said, I said, well, what do you think about answer choice D? And she's like, honestly, like I, I'm kind of hesitating right now because I don't know what I think of it. Like, I don't think it's right, but I don't know why I don't think it's right. And I know you're going to ask me. <laughs> So anyways, my point is is that if, if, if you have the financial means, it might make sense just to do one tutoring session right now and see if you're reviewing and approaching the test the way you should be. And if, it, if that's all you do even, then all the, all the studying that you do on your own after that point will be changed most likely because of that. And that could help you. Or you may say, wow, it's really helpful and I'm going to keep doing yeah. it. Every week, I don't know. I mean, every it's kind of it kind of comes down to money, honestly. Right, and that sucks, but it's reality. no, it is that's reality. Tutoring is really expensive, but when somebody does a tutoring session with me, I think what they're doing is they're trading their money for more time. Like you're just, I'm going to remove roadblocks for you. So if you, you know, there's just something there you you can't really figure it out. You've been banging your head against the wall. You're really frustrated. Sometimes you pay for a tutoring session and you come out of it feeling like, oh, everything's clear now. I don't have to keep wasting my time banging my head against the wall. Also, it was motivating to, you know, sit there with, with Nathan for two hours and have him yell at me about like what are all the things that I'm doing wrong. And then I like, I get it. It's like, you know, why do you have a personal trainer instead of just doing it on your own? Well, you're trading your money for their expertise and for their sort of like motivation, right? I think the people that are best for private tutoring are people who have put in some serious prep and are then like stuck. But you could abs you could absolutely be a complete novice who who just has the resources, and then it, it does make sense because we just like get going, you know, it get you going immediately. Mm -hmm. Chelsea says. World's question: Are there particular rules that trigger making worlds for in-out or grouping games? You guys talked a lot about when to split for sequencing games in the podcast, but what about other types of games? Uh, I would say in grouping games, if you have a grouping game in which um, you don't know how many are in each group, but they give you some rule that says like one group has to have more than another, a lot of times there's only three or four options. And then creating worlds based on how many are in each group can be very constricting and help the game. Also, anytime you have things that have to be together in grouping totally. games, like two people, have, um, that's the or first, two people. 
thing I thought of was there's that one in out game. It's a fixed number of spots in and out. And there's like PW or whatever that have to go together. Mm -hmm. And it's just real clear that you make a world where they're in and you make a world where they're out. And one of them just gets like completely filled up. So that's the same. That's not anything different. That's just a big block, right? We talked about that in sequencing games. If it was PW have to go consecutively, we would consider making worlds based on where PW end up in the sequence. But if PW have to either both be in or both be out, well, then we would make worlds based on where that big big block of PW go. Yeah. I mean, in in out games, there's always going to be the case that you have for every variable, it's either going to be in or out. So you could always split on the basis of one of the variables. If that variable tends to be tied into a lot of other rules. Totally. Yeah. You could just look for somebody who seems like they're a really important trigger. See what happens when they're in, see what happens when they're out, especially. Yeah. If they're the, if they're the sufficient condition on a rule, right. You could make a world where they're in, maybe that triggers the sufficient condition, make a world where they're out, then that doesn't, I mean, that means the rule doesn't apply anymore. Haha, ha, Samantha called me the most skeptical person in the world. I appreciate that. Jam says, when a question asks about the purpose of paragraph X, do you normally find yourself having to look back at the passage to see which paragraph they're talking about? Or as you're going through the questions. Do you remember the main point of each paragraph independently without having to look back? I think I probably glance back, but I I look back. Yeah. I look back. It's not rereading. It's more like, like kind of looking at the paragraph like, Oh yeah, this is where they were talking about whatever. And if you, if you read the paragraph carefully and the passage carefully, then you quickly remember what that, the theme of that paragraph was. And that's really helpful in terms of answering the primary purpose. Yeah. Okay. Muhammad wants to know if it's good to take an untimed practice test just to see what your potential is. I don't have a problem with people doing that every now and then. I think it especially can dispel the myth that your only problem is time. Yeah, which is completely a myth in many cases. You also could just time yourself and then finish the test untimed, and then you'd have both a timed and an untimed score. I mean, I think that might be even better, but... Yeah. I'm not sure how to pronounce Waitao says, what would you recommend for non-native speakers trying to improve their reading comp? Any special tips for non-native speakers who are trying to improve their reading comp? I honestly think the advice is the same for native speakers. The tackle each sentence one at a time and translate it. And your translation will probably be wrong, but I don't think you can give yourself the excuse that, Hey, I'm a non-native speaker. I I'm, I know that makes it harder, but at the same time, these sentences are hard for native speakers. And in some ways they can be at native speakers can be at a disadvantage because they're the way they read is based on just reading a lot of stuff. They don't necessarily know the rules. Whereas, you know, the rules, you might be able to actually unpack a sentence in a way that a native speaker could not. And so I I just, my main thing is I I don't know that I'd let the non-native speaker aspect of where you're coming at this become an excuse. Just know that these sentences are hard for everyone and they have to get good at translating them. And you kind of may be in a better position to do that. For the long run, I might additionally say, write down words that you don't know and look them up and learn them. Um, I mean, but I would say that to native speakers as well. Yeah. For non-native speakers, you know, you might want to try spending more time in English and less time in your native language. Like if you're speaking your native language a lot with friends and family, or if you're reading or watching TV in your native language, I don't know if it's hurting you on the LSAT, but it's not helping you. And if you were like instead reading or even watching English stuff, I feel like you're going to be picking up things from context by doing that. So I don't know, maybe that's an additional tip. Everybody's watching at work. This is funny. Haley, I guess it's an age. <laughs> yeah. Haley says, uh, got a 157 in November. I'm a huge splitter. I want my LSAT to match my higher GPA. I'm registered for March, but do you think I should plan to take July 2? I don't know when enough is enough a year later. Uh, she's been studying for almost a year. She says she's just starting to see real improvements. For some reason, this reminded me of my econ professor from freshman year. He said that, uh, you know, 
every time you make a decision, you have to think about what's ahead of you, not what's behind you. Yeah. It's a sunk cost. And his example was like, if you were in a relationship for five years, but then you realized it was a bad relationship. Some people want to stay in the relationship because they're like, I've invested all this time. But the reality is you have to think about how your life is going to be affected by staying going forward, not by what you've done in the past. So the fact that you've studied for a year maybe makes it feel like it's been a long time, but all that matters is what happens ahead of you. I would actually consider taking it in March and June and July. Totally. I mean, no stigma against high, uh, multiple takes. Law schools only care about your higher score. You know, especially when I hear from people that have really high GPAs and they're like that, the, the, uh, I kind of think that's a reverse splitter, right? People that are higher GPA, low LSAT. You have such a huge opportunity in front of you if you have a high GPA. I mean, yeah, that's that's the thing that's hard to fix. Yeah, the LSAT, the LSAT's hard to fix too. But if you spend a year of your life again, <laughs> or at least yeah. the next six months, and even if you just go up to like you said, you got a one fifty seven. Let's say you can get it up into the low one sixties. That's just a world of yeah. difference in terms of law schools. Yeah. yeah. To compare that to the typical splitter, like when I hear about people, sometimes I get emails from people who have like a real, real low GPA, like lower than my GPA, like a 2.2 or a 2.1 GPA. You could spend the rest of your life studying and get a 180 and you're still not going to Harvard, Stanford, Yale, you know, normally, like the odds are bad. No matter, no, no matter what, that's with literally a 180, like you're probably not getting in. And for Haley, she's got the opposite situation where she's not happy with her. Yeah, 157, you're not getting into Harvard, Stanford, Yale. But if you can get that to a 165 or a 167, if you've got really good grades, you very likely could be going to Harvard, Stanford, or Yale. So Yeah, especially so the top schools are going to look at your GPA. They're going to weight it a little bit more than your LSAT. Yeah. Keep trying, Haley, for sure, I think. Hunter says paying for tutoring is better than paying for law school. Yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> – thank you, Hunter. Uh, we we tend to agree. Um, Ashley says, I have 10 transcripts, seven from undergrad and three from grad. <laughs> Should I write an addendum to explain why? Explain why to us? Is that, that sounds like a lot. <laughs> why? why do you have seven from undergrad? Hmm. Huh. Yeah. Uh, explain it in an addendum and send it to the show. Love to, if we can get to it, we'll read it. Yeah. Josh, I've, I've heard this question before. Josh says a while ago, you did some work with a minority student. Is there any plans for a similar program in the future? Um, Josh, my, what I do is I give away uh, seats in my live classes when I have excess capacity. You can apply for those spots via my website. That's what I've been doing these days. Ben, do you do any similar things? Uh, yeah, as people write in and ask for it, it, it's an exception to the rule, but to the extent we can make exceptions, we do for sure. Yeah, from time to time, if people make a really smart case for it, um, I, I am inclined to help. I, I have to say that I'm more inclined to help people who have already put in a bunch of time and effort and have achieved something like the higher your LSAT score on record, the more likely, I know it might seem a little bit ironic, but the more you've been able to accomplish already, the more I am inclined to help people who can't afford to pay for my help. The people that I, I get, a, and I'm sorry, I get a lot of emails from people that are like, you know, I've been studying for a year and I'm just stuck at 132. What do I do? And it's like, I don't. Uh, I'm sorry, but it's just so difficult to help people that are in that situation. I don't know. I would I would say in the past I had a more formal process for uh, uh, doing scholarships and stuff like that. But uh, what I found is that I would accept people into the class and then they would stop coming. It was kind of yeah. like um, this hard situation where it's like, oh, someone got something for free and now they're not really taking advantage of it. And so – I don't know. It's been a hard thing to try to actually <laughs> implement because it's not clear whether someone's just hoping to get, you know, a free class or they're really serious. But like you said, Nathan, if someone's been doing a lot and they've done all the free resources, you can really see that commitment. And you're like, okay, yeah, let's help. Let's, let's do something. Let's figure this out. Totally. But sometimes 
when they haven't even taken advantage of the free stuff, you're kind of like, oh, are you just what's what's the situation here? And is this going to give up a seat? I don't know. It's it's tough. It's harder than I thought it would be. Yeah, my um, man, my experience it's sad but like when people come to me wanting a free seat and they've already scored a 160 they're not the type of people who stop showing up for the class they keep going to the class and when people show up asking for a free seat with a 130 those are the type of people that i have a hard time with like those are the people who end up not taking advantage of the resources that i provide to them and so i don't know you got to show me a little like performance before i'm inclined to help you know really these days um let's move on i got time and a half annalisa got time and a half for march what should she do to study differently i would just say just do give yourself 53 minutes when you do the practice tests in sections that's the only thing i would do differently otherwise everything would be the same yeah and if you're in an lsat class like mine where we do a lot of times sections 35 minute sections um just treat those 35 minutes as the first 35 of the 53 that you know you're going to get. You could give yourself an additional 18 minutes after the te- after the section's over and figure out what your actual score was. But yep. yeah, just definitely give yourself that full time. You might also, um, Annalisa, do your full practice tests with 53 minutes what? and force yourself to do it like with like that with 53 minutes because yeah. it's going to be a long ass <laughs> day. Yeah. Yeah. For people who have 70 minutes, it's just like, a, that's a marathon. Yeah, that seems brutal. Jordan says, could someone theoretically stream LSAT tutoring over Twitch without facing legal challenge from LSAC if the streamer only uses the June 2007 LSAT as reference material? Well, hey, we do June 2007 on the podcast and on videos on our websites and in even in our books and stuff or my books and we don't, there's no problem. That stuff, they posted it on the internet. So we're assuming that there's not a problem with that. I think Jordan, if you uh, want to do June 2007 stuff, you can. So wait, is this, a, this is like an idea. Should we do a, should we try to get on Twitch? That sounds hip. <laughs> yeah. Although it probably wouldn't be as interesting as gaming. Yeah. If we're going on Twitch, I'm going to be like playing, I don't know, playing some video games. Uh, ben, what happened to your law school? William wants to know. <laughs> 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 I was hoping no one remembered that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I wised up and decided that, I don't know, I just, it would have been cool on some level, but also just, I don't know, education seems like a nightmare. <laughs> Says a teacher, professional you teacher. <laughs> you mean certification, education that actually certifies people um, for something. Yeah, just get it, becoming part of that, that academic community. I don't know. <laughs> it does seem like you would have a bunch of really miserable colleagues. Um, yeah, that, that does seem tough. The whole process too, right? Like, yeah, you got to get accredited. But I guess that was the point was to fight the, the trend. But I just don't know. I don't have it in me. <laughs> <laughs> I believed you. I thought you were really going to do it. But uh, I was, uh, well, that's interesting. I guess, I, yeah, I could convince myself maybe. Even. Yeah, yeah, you convinced me. Um, Omid wants to talk about my AirPods. Every time I see AirPods, I say, no, they don't fall out. Um, mine do not fall out at all. I hike with them. I run with them. I don't think they have ever fallen out once. Um, I did see on the internet, some someone posted on like Twitter, a pair of earrings that were like little buckets. And the idea was that they were supposed to catch your AirPods if they fell out of your ears. Um, I'm fortunate to have ears that fit ear pods, air pods, they don't fall out. So I don't need to get those earrings. If you did need to get those earrings, I would think maybe just don't use air pods, but air pods are the shit. Uh, I have to tell you, air pods are the greatest. If you don't already have air pods, I highly, highly endorse them. They're just awesome. I love them. Annalisa likes our tip about the 53 minutes full test with 53 minutes. Yeah, that's going to suck, but you got to do it. You're getting extra time. Victoria wants to know if we're going to do a class down south anytime soon. I don't where where Victoria. Where do you want to Where do you want us to go? Come hang with the future cowboy lawyers. Wow. Well, Austin maybe. Atlanta. Atlanta. Huh. Cool. And now we're getting into the silly questions. Jam wants to know if I could pick one board game that is the closest to the kind of thinking in logic games. What would it be? Hmm. 
a board game that's, that's like logic games. I don't know. I it's not a board game, it's a video game. I played this game called XCOM that's a turn-based tactics game and because you only have a limited squad, like you'll have five or six soldiers and they you can put them you can make them take their turns in whatever order you want and then you can choose what they do on their turn. And so I find that to be very much like each of your turns is like a little mini logic game because you have to decide who's going to do what in what order. So that's XCOM. The most recent version of XCOM 2 is just like really super badass. So get that. I think it's better on PC than it is on, it always crashes on my PS4, So which is sad. Samantha, thank you for your support. She's giving a PSA to tell everybody, please to like or emoji our shit on Facebook. She says that's helpful for their algorithms. Yes, everybody please do hit likes and stuff. Adam. Would you rather only be able to eat Halo Top ice cream instead of normal ice cream for the rest of your life or lose four fingers of your choice? That's easy, man. Yeah, I, I would not actually, I would just not eat ice cream. Not, the question there is, would you rather not eat ice cream for the rest of your life or lose four fingers? And I would just not eat ice cream. There's ain't no way I'm going to eat Halo Top, but I would just not eat ice cream and Keep my fingers. You had to eat ice cream. You'd still eat ice cream, Halo Top over losing your. Fingers. I would even right. if I had to. I would choke down, the, whatever the minimum, minimum amount is. <laughs> Adam, Adam, this question is like the questions I get from my kids. They come in, and they're like, they're like, Dad, would you rather, would you rather swim across the ocean, or eat dirt? I'm like. <laughs> Why? Like, what? What? Where did that come from? Like, and then, and then they're like, "Okay, okay, here's another one. Would you rather punch your hand through glass or, you know, dig up money?" And it's like, where do you come up with these things? I, I mean, cut off four fingers. <laughs> I guess some things just don't die, Adam. That's fine. Yeah, even if that was one finger, I would still be keeping my finger. I am not uh, going to be doing any kind of chopping. Joshua says, don't forget to plug Vegas. Hey, thanks. If you want a commercial, we can make a commercial. Um, March 16, 17. Yeah. Uh, that's a Friday, uh, Saturday, Sunday. We'll have a drinking else at on Friday night, the 15th. We'll all go out. And then Saturday, Sunday, we will uh, do full days of instruction. You can sign up for those now. Actually, today's the last day to sign up for the discounted price. Um, so if you are thinking that you want one of those seats, you better get on it. Register on thinkinglsat.com right now. Thanks, Josh, for the reminder to actually sell something. Everybody loves AirPods. Thanks, Francesca. Victoria wants us to go to Dallas. Got another vote for Atlanta, Austin, Tulsa, Florida. Damn. I'm, I'm game, but we need to, you know, know that we would be able to fill a room like just not really even for the money. It's just that it's much more fun to teach a full class. So the more people are in the classroom, the more fun we have. If we can get connected to your Pula Society, if we can get maybe some like group sales going or something where we know that we're going to have 20 people minimum, you know, that that would make us much more likely to come to your town. So if somebody wants to help set it up and if you think that you can, um, you know, help us to you know, get a good, healthy crowd, we'd love to come. I, I'd go anywhere, Ben, as, as long as we thought there was going to be a fun group to teach and feel like yeah. productive, feel good about it. Yeah. Hey, I got to hop off pretty soon. I'm sorry. Okay. Got a couple minutes. Yeah. We should wrap it up in, in a few minutes. Um, well, I'll just keep answering a couple questions. Uh, Omid, do you guys recommend writing super brief summaries of each paragraph until you catch on to how to approach reading comp the way you both suggest? Like training to bring training your brain to think a certain way. Hmm. That's not advice I've ever given. I'm hesitant to do it because there's this general principle that's like you want to play the way or you want to practice the way you're ultimately going to play yeah. um, when in doubt, right? But there is something to be said about writing things down, like kind of forcing yourself to go through this and then seeing if you're really coming up with it. My concern is that, that you're almost like developing a different skill. At the same time, I wouldn't have a problem with you doing it once again and just see if you can articulate it. I would say a lot of times when people say what they think the main point is, they default to, 
to things like, oh, well, it's about tigers and we need to move beyond that. And maybe writing would help you move beyond that. And if that would, that, that might be good. Yeah, you can give it a try. I just wouldn't be doing it for very long. I don't, I don't see much of a point in it. I think you need to be just engaging with the argument. That's how you comprehend. You just fight with it, argue with it. Think about what they're saying. If you're thinking about it, you don't need to write anything down. If you're writing stuff down, I think it means you're just not thinking about it that much. Um, yeah. Hannah is asking if we already discussed advice for study motivation. <laughs> that was on the agenda, but then we just started answering questions. So we didn't do much about motivation. Is there anything else on that bullet point list, Ben, that you wanted to make sure you uh, cover before you have to hop off? No, I, I think we've talked about a lot of those things on the show. I would just say one thing that's helpful for me, it's kind of a silly thing, but it, it works, is I'll take a three by five card and I will start doing like little marks. So I'll do every time I do one small thing, I'll do a mark. Like I'll, and I just, my goal is just to do five things. And then it's like, then I can do whatever I want. And then I could do five more things. So if you, if you're having trouble getting started with the LSAT, if you just get out a three by five card and start ticking things off, it's like, I just have to do five questions and then I can go do something else. And then once you've done that other thing, you can go back to the LSAT. It's just like, try to make this as easy to start as possible. I think that a lot of times we don't start doing something because we make it so much bigger. It's like, if I'm going to study, then I really should study for two hours and I should do really well. And it's like, yeah, that would be nice. But if, you, if you're not going to start at all because you want the perfect over the good, like just make your task much smaller. Go do it and then go do something else. Reward yourself for that. There's nothing wrong with like getting into the habit. I th consistency is so powerful. Yeah. I, I, yeah, that's the one thing I've been thinking about more than anything else is just getting into routines that make it easy for you because you just don't have to decide. It's just like, that's what I do in the morning. I downloaded this app called um, The Fabulous. It's kind of fun, uh, oddly named. It's The Fabulous. And the, like, the first thing they have you do is uh, put a glass of water by the side of your bed and commit to drinking water the first thing when you get up in the morning. And the idea is that it becomes a routine where like, this is a healthy thing that I'm doing for myself first thing in the morning, every single day. It's also part of your nighttime routine because it's like put a glass of water next to your bed. And then when they get you to commit to those simple things, then they start tacking on, you know, additional simple things, like just sort of baby steps and building that up. So if you can find a time in your day where you're going to do literally one LSAT question, like, on my lunch break at work every day, I do one logic game or I do one logical reasoning question and commit to it and do it for a week, you know, and then try to add a little more to it instead of biting off more than you can chew from the beginning and doing too much, I think is demotivating. Having those little tiny wins, right? That's really similar to your five check marks, Ben. Yeah, cool. Well, I better, I better hop off, but... Um, I'll email you. It seems like you got to go do stuff. Why don't I just... I'll try to answer the rest of these after you go, and I'll just spend a few more minutes, but thanks, Ben. Yeah, thank you. Okay. See ya. That was fun, guys. Yeah, I'm just going to like go a few more minutes. Own law school application process, what would you have done differently? For me, for sure, I would have applied earlier, and I would have applied more broadly, and I would have negotiated harder for scholarships. Like, I just didn't do any of those things. I only applied to, like, three schools, and I just didn't – it wasn't smart the way I did it. Like, I think Hastings knew that they were the best school I had applied to, and I got in everywhere I applied, and they just didn't give me a very good scholarship because they knew that I was not, like, a very savvy applicant. When you apply late and when you only apply to a few schools, you just look like – a sucker that, that plans to pay full price. And so I, I should have not done it that way. I should have applied much more broadly and really tested my value in the marketplace and then made a much more sensible decision about where I went instead of paying too much money. I, I, Samantha, I'm, I'm not saying don't go to law school, I, but I am saying be savvy about the way you apply and really don't, um, you know, try not to pay for law school. Uh, when redoing a logic game you did a while ago, do you think it's better to try and do it the same way you did before and try to get faster? No, I do not. Or do you think it's better to try a different approach, like doing worlds on the basis of a different element or block a hundred percent 
uh, jam, that is exactly what I recommend is that you try doing the same game in different ways, especially making worlds. You used this rule to make worlds the first time. Okay, try a different rule or try a different block or try a different anything. Just just compare different approaches. I'm not about like, here is the way you do this game and then you just have to learn how to do that same way faster. I, I think that's bogus. I think you need to develop a deeper understanding of the different ways that you might be able to approach the games by trying each game in different ways. Haley suggests Ann Arbor, Michigan for a class. Sure, fine. Uh, I ain't going there in the winter time, but I'll go in the summer. Hunter, do I have any books um, on reading comp? I My first three books, Cheating the LSAT, Breaking the LSAT, and Exposing the LSAT, all three of those have a full section of reading comprehension. So you could check those out. My Logical Reasoning Encyclopedia also, I think if you get really good at must be true and main point questions in logical reasoning, it's gonna pay some dividends for uh, your reading comprehension performance as well. So uh, the Logical Reasoning Encyclopedia might by osmosis help your uh, reading comp. Hunter says, what about buying Palomino pencils and boxy erasers for motivation? Read it in the loophole and I think it's good. I think it's motivating to have good gear. That's funny. I bought pencils the other day from like this art store and I gave them to my classes in San Francisco and LA. I got, they had to, they got to pick what slogan they wanted, you know, and they were like kind of funny slogans, sort of badass ish slogans and uh, like goddamn genius or whatever. And I, I gave them those pencils to like use while they were studying or to use on the day of the test. And I could see how there could be something something to that, but you don't really need much gear for the LSAT. You know, you need a, uh, you need a pencil and I don't really think you need a special eraser because you really shouldn't be erasing very much on the test anyway. So, uh, a nice pencil, sure. Treat yourself. They only cost like a buck. I don't know. Maybe you'd have a special, what about a special cozy sweater or something that you wear? That might be motivating. If you you've made it part of your routine, like I always sit down at this, my favorite spot, get myself a fancy cup of coffee or something like that. That could be motivating. Um, Sebastian, am I looking to have beers in Salt Lake City? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm going to stay uh, tomorrow night. I will be in Salt Lake and I am going to stay downtown. I don't even have a room yet, but I'm going to stay downtown somewhere. And after the event, I will, yes, we'll be going to a local bar. Um, all I need is one other person to go have <laughs> a beer with um, after class before I crash uh, in my hotel. So sure. Absolutely. Sebastian hit me up and we will talk about having a beer tomorrow night in Salt Lake city. Okay. Last question. Samantha says, I seem to keep having major breakthroughs right after official tests. I'm scheduled for March as my third test and hope that's all I need. But if I have another major breakthrough is a fourth official test too much. Absolutely not. Not these days. They removed the restriction on how many times you can take the LSAT and people are absolutely taking advantage of that. People are taking the test four and five and six times. And if you have another major breakthrough and your practice tests are higher than whatever your highest score is on record, I think it would be foolish not to retake the test a fourth or even fifth or sixth official time because that's the number that's going to go into the school's index calculations and on their ABA 509 and in the data that they report out to the U.S. News and World Report. So, um, yeah, it's totally worth it. If you think you are still improving, you probably are. And if you think you can do better, you probably can. So, I, yeah, I'm a big advocate of taking the test one more time. All right, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, thanks all y'all for coming. Nice knowing you. Don't pay for law school and all that. Thanks, guys. See ya.